Ahoy hoy. Have you ever wondered to yourself who in their right mind would claim to be in charge of the SCP Foundation? I mean, we're talking about an organization made up of psychopaths and killers and sadistic monsters and also a bunch of SCPs. But recently, someone asked a question of me. They said, well, they didn't ask me specifically, but they just asked in general about, like, what's the general organizational structure of the SCP Foundation? And it inspired me to make a video about it. So today we're going to talk about who is in charge of the SCP Foundation and how its organization is structured. Let's get started. So first of all, obviously, when we talk about the SCP Foundation, the people in charge are the O5 Council. Now, O, in this particular case, it is specific. It's not 05, but literally the letter O. Now, what does the O mean? Well, that's up in the air, much like most things about the SCB Foundation. We've got Overseer, Overwatch, Operations... Really, the term O5 Council is about as nebulous a term as it can get, because first of all, you would think the O5 Council would have five members, but it doesn't. O5 generally would mean the security level of the people involved, which is to say that only the O5 Council has level five access, and that should be the top level access to all of the SCP Foundation secrets. But that's not even technically true because the way classification works tends to be on a need to know sort of thing. So there's probably stuff that say 053 knows that 0510 uh, doesn't have access to, just as an example. Also, there aren't five members. There are anywhere between 12 and 13 members. In certain canons, there's going to be less, but generally 12 or 13, uh, depending on who you ask. Mainly because both 12 and 13 are significant numbers for lack of a better way to put it 12 is you know there are 12 apostles 12 you know all, it's a very important religious number but 13 also has that uh occult feel to it so there's 12 or 13 depending on the canon regardless these guys are the ones who are in charge of the scp foundation they meet they generally you would expect to have equal amounts of authority though groups of them could vote groups of you it's a council so say if you can get a majority to vote somebody out then that person is no longer a member of the council the thing is in most canons and to, to be honest with you how it would probably operate in real life even if they are nominally equal in authority the people who have been there longer with a bare base of support the you know can persuade other people a little bit better would tend to have a little bit more authority there's probably a certain amount of seniority involved like the oldest members kind of get a precedence or not precedence preference on uh being able to speak first and make their opinions known and then you've got the below the o5 council so <laughs> After you get past that, there's, you know, 12 or 13 O5 council members who make votes on everything. And, then, and they're not supposed, by the way, this is this is something that just comes up every once in a while. They're early on in the foundations, like texts and stuff. There's a kind of a rule that the O5 council is not supposed to technically ever be in contact with an SCP just because of the opportunity for them to be corrupted by it in one way or the other, either through info hazards or cognito hazards. You, you get the deal. So they're not supposed to be in contact with SCPs, but that has kind of fallen by the wayside in recent years. I, I Not fully, but still. After that, though, once we get past the O5 Council, the next biggest source of authority is probably the Ethics Committee. And that might be a little bit odd to hear, or it might not be odd to hear, but, but the way it's been portrayed ever since the Ethics Committee orientation is that the Ethics Committee is scarily powerful, to the point where it's likely that one member of the O5 Council is probably in charge of the Ethics Committee, and that's just, like, their thing. They don't bother with sites or, you know, uh, cogn you know, the various departments that need to be run, but rather just run the Ethics Committee. And that person probably has more authority than most of the other guys when it comes right down to it, uh, because they have their it, their influence has to flow from the top, because when the ethics committee member says you can't do this thing, then they're going into, say, a site. And we'll talk about this in a second, where 
the site director is God and the project director on a particular project is God, except for the people who are technically above them. So lesser gods, we'll say. Regardless, the ethics committee is much less defined and much less uh, used than the O5 uh, council is. Not to say that there aren't ethics committee members. Dr. Sumerian, the character, not me personally, but the character Dr. Sumerian in lore is a prominent member of the ethics committee. Uh, in some cases, in some canons, he's the he's in charge of the ethics committee, though that's that's rarer than just being a ran random member because the ethics committee doesn't their management doesn't really get talked about too much um however think of it like in a corporate structure and this may be helpful to some people and less helpful to others but anyone who's worked in any job knows that there's you know managers but then there's also the hr department and they kind of work together back and forth if you've ever watched the office maybe that'll help because most people have watched the office uh, Toby, Toby is the HR guy and he kind of has the ability to tell, uh, the guy who's in char actually in charge, the actual manager, certain things that he can and can't do. What, what, that's a whole other matter entirely. <laughs> we'll talk about how much I love the office in another time. Regardless, uh, this is a good example of how HR can work inside a normal corporate structure. Uh, and, and it is useful to think about the SCP foundation as a corporate structure because that's generally kind of how it works so there's the corporate leadership which is the o5 council and their their apparatus obviously the o5 council isn't just 13 guys they have their own employees they have their own processes there's the ethics committee beneath them they have their own guys their own processes and then you have the individual sites now it maybe corporate structure won't work for you. There's also ways you could parallel it to, say, the U.S. government with states and the federal government. Uh, but each site, to me, is more like a franchise. Like, say, for example, in a fast food franchise, McDonald's doesn't actually run the individual stores. They send down directives. They send down you know guidelines. They probably provide a little bit of guidance on the HR thing. But in the end, the store manager is the person who is ultimately in charge of the day-to-day -day operations, and their word is law. Now, someone can come in like a regional manager and actually like say, do this, do this, then that, and the site director would have to actually follow through on that. Now, that, normally you would think that that would be like in the SCP Foundation's hierarchy. What is a regional manager versus a... Uh, regular store manager. So what's a site director's version of the regional manager? It would probably just be a regional director. You could look at the um, can in the Gulf, for example. In the Gulf there, it's a collection of sites set in the South. And uh, Kate McTerris, I believe, it's been a really long time since I've actually read it, my, the canon that I helped start, but Kate McTerris in the Gulf canon, for example, is a regional director. Uh, she also helps run the MTF in that particular, one of the MTFs in that particular area, which is kind of a go-to, like, there's a hot spot, we move our MTF over there for it. Uh, an unassigned MTF, for lack of a better way to put it. And her as a regional director could show up at a site and be like, hey, do this thing. I don't care that you're a site director and that you supposedly normally have ultimate authority here. I'm telling you, as a directive of the SCP Foundation's greater goals, we need to change this, this, and this. And then at a site, so we've got the O5 Council, their subsidiaries, the Ethics Committee just a little bit below that, and then you've got your site directors, and maybe regional directors are a buffer a little bit between the O5 Council and the site directors. But once you get to the site director level, we're talking about the organization of a particular site. And each individual site is organized a little differently than the others because they must necessarily be organized differently. Each one's going to have different projects going at any particular time. And those projects are going to have their own departments based around them. Smaller projects like SCP-173 that have been researched to death probably only have a basic containment set up with, uh, you know, <laughs> it's not it's not a very cushy job because there's not a lot of upward mobility for the guy in charge of the SCP-173 project that's been researched to death. The only thing they need to do is keep it in containment and keep the floors clean. So 
that's probably and if you think about it it's like those are the things like you start small you start at the bottom of the ladder and you probably work your way up to more and more important assignments but each department's going to have for one as i was mentioning 173 is probably just very simple but there are more complex uh scps that would require multiple department types so by you know there are scps that have a biological a mimetic and you know and a maybe a pyrophoric uh problem or uh elements i should say and so you would need you know someone someone who's different departments to deal with each of these individual problems and then the department heads for that could work together on the full containment of the thing and maybe for streamlining one of those department heads is also the project head god this is we're talking about so much organizational structure here. I better have some stuff on the screen for this. <laughs> but those guys will all answer to your site director. And the site director and the ethics committee liaison for that site, generally how I've seen it. Uh, and I think it's been mostly adopted by the rest of the uh, the rest of the wiki at this point. But the ethics committee liaison for a particular site is the he's the guy who is the go between between the ethics committee and the site director and the site director. And the ethics committee liaison are essentially the ultimate authorities on everything that happened at a particular site. Site director, a little bit more so. The ethics committee liaison should be kind of hands off, except when necessary. But the ethics committee liaison is going to have full authority to just straight up fire somebody if necessary. And in the SCB Foundation, that may require some amnestic applications, but still. Uh, and it, it, there's some limits to that, certainly so. Like if an ethics committee liaison decided that the site director had to go, he couldn't just go into his office and have him fired. That would be complex and probably, and honestly, depending on the reasons why that person's being fired, may result in some gunfire. <laughs> the uh, really important thing to remember is that everything flows from the authority of the O5 council. So he's going to have to go to his superiors and they'll go to their superiors. And finally, there'll be a directive handed down that so-and-so has to be removed processes bureaucracy red tape all over the place and when we talk about the individual projects and we've talked about leadership in those projects the you know individual departments for a particular scp those individual departments have department heads and those department heads have to have their people in their departments so there are researchers junior researchers and just doctors in general and when we use the term junior researcher versus researcher versus doctor they're a doctor is not necessarily a superior to a researcher a doctor is just a title a researcher would just like they all have the job title of researcher whereas doctor is used because that's their title they have a doctorate uh, so a doctor could very well be inferior in rank to say just for seniority's sake to a researcher now a lot of lore on the scp wiki treats the term doctor as though it's a t like not a title but like an actual position within the foundation that's just straight up not how it works and definitely not how it would work in any sort of real world application and as you get further down you get to your junior researchers who are definitely to the inferior of the other possible options here they're the lowest tier on the researcher uh ladder but they're not the lowest tier necessarily of employees because there's other parts of the foundation beyond just the department just the basic like research departments and or study departments there's the mtfs there's the security systems i mean there's any sites going to have an anti-memetics that most sites should have an anti-memetics division they also might have like a site that cut that deals with a lot of reality warpers might have an was it ontokinesis is that the word it is i, I look i took a second and looked it up to be sure yeah might have an ontokinesis department that's just an overarching department to cover the problems of having a bunch of reality warpers in the same place might be ex a lot of experts on scranton reality anchors and how to ensure the hume levels stay whatever they're supposed to be regardless uh, so there's going to be individual special departments in particular sites but also every site's going to have like i said every site's got to have an anti-memetics division probably a records division uh talk about risa the uh security departments and 
just in general the stuff you would ex just the general stuff you might expect in a site like like i said the security departments uh, uh technical support uh, janitorial services that's the kind of basic stuff and you'd be like well don't d-class handle that well those are the bottom bottom of the level but no there's probably a set of individuals who are at least aware that they're working at a secret facility without knowing many of the finer details of what that entails just the idea that you know and some of them do because you know the people who have to work in close proximity eventually learn these things anyway um but not to the probably not to the fullest extent like they don't know about the end of the world stuff but they might know that there's magic in the world they might know that you know there's anomalies that cause problems and such um and these people would be drawn from the general population but also like in a sense that you've got to find people who are uh who <laughs> pass their background checks properly but the number of people you need to the point at this point becomes sort of an it's like it's impossible for everyone to be completely clean so weirdly as you think about it you'd have to look for people who are going to be good at the job but who <laughs> won't find work elsewhere uh, you're gonna have to pay them more as well like a lot more have them signing non-disclosure agreements and all these other things give them all these benefits and etc for jobs where normally they'd be making say minimum wage as like a janitor or whatever um a good choice for that would certainly be people who have low-level drug offenses uh, who can't find who may have difficulty finding jobs elsewhere but who otherwise would be completely reliable the scp foundation is going to be entirely pragmatic for this sort of thing uh and realistically intelligent i would imagine so you've got all the way down to you know your basic staff level and then you get into your d class and the d class are literally just dis supposedly disposable testing subjects um and the level of how disposable they are will throw it up in the air. But you guys probably know by now how I feel about that. But there is some level of dispo. I'm not going to say there isn't some level of disposability about them, but obviously, uh, <laughs> not not to the level that ne is necessarily portrayed in all of the science fiction. But to some level, there has to be. This is an incredibly dangerous thing. How do we test it without risking someone's life? Well, let's throw a D class at it. Uh, let's try to do our best to make sure that D-Class doesn't die, but if he does, we understand that that's a possibility and we're not going to get sued for it because this guy is has been disappeared at this point. And that's it. You start from the top and you work your way down, and if you think about it, it's not any different than any normal non-secret non, you know, non governmental agency's structure. The only difference is that the whole thing is surrounded by secrecy. Uh, and if you try to get out, you generally would end up getting amnesticized. That's it. If you have any more questions or something you think that I didn't quite cover here, let me know in the comments down below. I didn't really talk too much about the NTFs, uh, and those would be, I would say, under their own sort of thing. <laughs> like, talking about NTFs is it's a whole video of its own. This is already, I'm going to cut it down as best I can, but this is already 20 minutes long. So <laughs> we'll talk about NTFs in a different video. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, hit the subscribe button and then hit the notification bell next to that so you're notified when I upload new videos. Then head on over to patreon.com forward slash D Sumerian and pledge at any level like everybody here on the screen already has, including probably a wizard and definitely not a scientist at $40, hot-headed Canadian at $50, lawful evil at $60, and Vivi at $88. Thank you very much for letting me know that I'm not alone out here. And I will see you all again on Tuesday.